Good evening. This is Father Anderson, rector of St. Albans Church here in Joppa, Maryland, and we are continuing our Lenten study for Lent 2024 on the seven sacraments. I'm here in the parish hall with my live studio audience of parishioners and friends, and it's great to have you with us today. I'm sitting on the couch today because the rocker that I was sitting in um, sort of bothering my, my hips. So see how sitting on a nice soft couch does. Uh, if you ha Make sure you have your 1928 prayer book ready to go, and we will begin with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. With Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together again to study the sacraments of the church. Thank you for the time of fellowship and the wonderful meal that we share here at the church. We thank you for everyone who has joined us here and, and online, and pray that you would bless us as we study together and grow and strive to deepen our faith in thee and in thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're going to look at today at the sacraments of the Holy Eucharist. Now, this is, we're not going to be able to get into this really deep because it's just a vast, infinite subject. So we'll do the best we can. And um, just going back to the catechism that we looked at, uh, we, we started with sacraments in general and the sacrament of holy baptism. And then last week we looked at the sacrament of confirmation. Um, and the Eucharist, which we're looking at today, is the final of the sacraments that are called the sacraments of initiation. So once you've been baptized, confirmed, and made your communion, and become a commu communicant member of the church, you are a fully initiated Christian. So turn with me, if you will, in your prayer book to page uh, 291. This is the second office of instruction, which is based on the, the catechism. And we see, um, uh, looking back at confirmation last week, um, what does the church provide to help you do these things, to, to follow Christ, worship God every Sunday in his church, work, pray, and give for the spread of his kingdom? The answer was the church provides the sacrament of confirmation or laying on of hands, wherein after renewing the promises and vows of my baptism and declaring my loyalty and devotion to Christ as my master, I receive the strengthening gifts of the Holy Spirit. That was confirmation. Now, the Eucharist. Next question, bottom of page 291. After you have been confirmed, what great privilege doth our Lord provide for you? Our Lord provides the sacrament of the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion for the continual strengthening and refreshing of my soul. So we have been baptized into Christ. We have been confirmed and strengthened, given the gifts of the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. And now we need that fuel, as it were, uh, that that power to to live and to follow Christ each day, and that is the uh, body and blood of Christ, the sacrament of Holy Communion. So the prayer book does, um, as we looked at last week, say you should be confirmed before you make your communion, before you are given communion. Now let's go to the next page, 292. Actually, 293. Okay, 292 we looked at on the first session, and that was uh, about baptism. 293, why was the sacrament of the Lord's Supper ordained? The sacrament of the Lord's Supper was ordained for the continual remembrance of the sacrifice of the death of Christ and of the benefits which we receive thereby. So this is what Jesus says in the words of institution in the biblical narrative, do this in remembrance of me. What is the outward part or sign of the Lord's Supper? The outward part or sign is bread and wine, which the Lord hath commanded to be received. The Eucharist always has to be celebrated with bread and wine. Uh, you can't use uh, rice cakes. You can't use soda. You can't use whiskey. You know, you name it. It has to be bread and wine. Um, the wine traditionally has to have a certain alcohol level. I think it's 18% or something like that. Could be wrong. Um, 
that? Well, that's that's actually in Roman Catholic canon law, which is kind of a good thing to kind of good gauge to go by. It has to be fermented. You can't use grape juice. You can't use um, um, you know, drambuie, whatever. Uh, as good as that stuff is. Um, now, there is such a thing called a low gluten wafer. So people who have gluten allergies um, often ask for low gluten wafers, and that has just enough gluten in it to qualify as a communion host, but a very small amount so the person won't be agitated or bothered by it. So we do that here. If If you ever come here and you need low gluten, please tell me before the service begins so I can get that ready for you. Um, uh, but there are some people that cannot receive any kind of uh, gluten. It's that severe. Uh, and there are conversely some people that do not receive uh, the precious blood. I've seen this with recovering alcoholics, um, people who are just germ phobes. Um, they don't want to receive the precious blood or common chalice. Um, there is a doctrine called the doctrine of concomitance, which means that the fullness of Christ is in each species of the sacrament. So you get the full body and blood of Christ if you receive just the host. You get the full body and blood of Christ if you receive just the, the precious blood. So, um, but the outward sign is bread and wine. What is, uh, back to the Office of Instruction, page 293, what is the inward part or thing signified, that is the body and blood of Christ, which are spiritually taken and received by the faithful in the Lord's Supper. Spiritually taken. We will get into this momentarily. Um, what are the benefits whereof we are partakers in the Lord's Supper? The benefits are the strengthening and refreshing of our souls by the body and blood of Christ, as our bodies are strengthened and refreshed by the wine. <clears throat> and finally, what is required of those who come to the Lord's Supper? It is required of those who come to the Lord's Supper to examine themselves, whether they repent them truly of their former sins, with steadfast purpose to lead a new life, to have a lively faith in God's mercy through Christ, with a thankful remembrance of his death, and to be in charity with all men. And that is exactly what we... Um, are exhorted to confess, you know, in, in the confession that we say at, at the communion service, and also in the exhortations, which are at the tail end of the communion service of the church. Examine yourself, be in love and charity with all men. You find that that's almost word from word taken from the first exhortation. So that is the the catechism. I, I do want to touch briefly on the articles, the article of religion on this, and then we're going to uh, go to the communion service and we're going to pull everything together here. So if uh, you go to your prayer book, uh, to the, the back of it, to the articles of religion, <coughs> yeah, six, um, okay, 608, okay, article, um, article uh, 28 of the Lord's Supper. The Supper of the Lord is not only a sign of the love that Christians ought to have among themselves, one to another, that's addressing a Reformation controversy that it was by some extreme uh, reformers and Protestants that it was just a, a love feast where we all sort of, sort of like coffee hour, but rather it is a sacrament of our redemption by Christ's death, insomuch that to such as rightly, worthily, and with faith receive the same, the bread which we break is a partaking of the body of Christ, and likewise the cup of blessing is a partaking of the blood of Christ. So that is taken almost verbatim from the Apostle Paul's words in First, in first Corinthians. Transubstantiation, or the change of the substance of bread and wine, transubstantiation, changing of the substance, in the supper of the Lord cannot be proved by holy writ. Well, that's obvious because it, that theory came along uh, centuries, centuries later, but is repugnant to the plain words of Scripture. 
overthroweth the nature of a sacrament. This was probably the most stinging critique of the uh, reformers of transubstantiation, because if you change the substance of bread and the substance of wine, then you don't have bread and wine anymore. So you have no sacraments. So it's kind of an academic point to make, but um, it's you know an interesting one nonetheless. And hath given occasion to many superstitions, and that was certainly the case, you know, in the Reformation era, um, in in some places. Um, let's continue. The body of Christ is given, taken, and eaten in the supper only after an heavenly and spiritual manner. So we're not um, cannibals eating the chewing on the literal flesh of of Jesus and drinking his literal uh, blood. Um, and again, we're going to see this word spiritual in the communion service a lot. Um, and the mean whereby the body of Christ is received and eaten in the supper is faith. So to any outward person, if you were to take the bread and the wine that I've consecrated and um, take it home and look at it, it, well, it just looks like bread to me, you know, it looks like. Just wine, port wine to me, um, you know, but it's by faith that we perceive that it is more than that. It is the body and blood of Christ. Uh, and then finally, the sacraments of the Lord's Supper was not by Christ's ordinance reserved, carried about, lifted up, or worshipped. So this, to, someday, sometimes you'll still see Anglican clergy today that refuse to elevate the host and I know of one in particular. He's a, he's a heck of a guy. He's a great great priest. Don't get me wrong, um, but he says I don't elevate the host because of what the article of religion says, you know. And he believes in the real presence and the, it's the body and blood of Christ, but he will not not elevate it. So that that's what he does. That again, that is also reflecting confirmations uh, or, or controversies rather at the time of the Reformation. Um, a lot of that is simply just this is is, is irrelevant to us today, uh, which is why in the in the newer Episcopalian Book of Common Prayer of 1979 they put the Articles of Religion and they called the section historical documents, which they kind of got criticized for in some some respects, but it's actually quite accurate because these the Articles of Religion have never had any authority in the American Episcopal Church or any group or church that came out of it, such as the Anglican province of America. Okay, real quick here. Um, next article, uh, 29. The wicked and such as be void of lively faith, although they do carnally and visibly press with their teeth the sacraments of the body and, and blood of Christ, yet in no wise are they partakers of Christ, but rather to their condemnation do eat and drink the sign or sacraments of so great a thing. That, again, goes back to the Apostle Paul. The article references St. Augustine there. Um, so a, a wicked person is not receiving the body and blood of Christ. He or she is just visibly chewing on it and unfortunately doing the, so uh, to their condemnation. <coughs> and finally, of both kinds, the cup of the Lord is not to be denied to the lay people, for both the parts of the Lord's sacraments, for both the parts of the Lord's sacrament by Christ's ordinance and commandment ought to be ministered to all Christian men alike. So this was, again, time of the Reformation. People probably made their communion once a year at Easter. The reformers and the English reformers are trying to get people to regularly make their communion, um, ideally every Sunday. Everyone partakes of it, not just the priest who is offering. Um, and then they not only receive just the host, the body of Christ in one kind, they too would drink from the chalice. That actually meant that in the Church of England at the time, they had to manufacture larger chalices because they had these really tiny chalices and these cups because only the priest would uh, partake of the, the precious blood. And there are also financial considerations involved, too, because you had to then buy all of this wine. Now, the, the story of why the sacrament ends up being celebrated less or, or, or partaken of less frequently in the Middle Ages 
um, has to do with the barbarian invasions and the general um, decline in morality. So the church became very guarded in who they admitted to Holy Communion because they don't want people being condemned to hell, according to Paul's words. And that's where you get this tradition of just once a year communion at Easter that you would take after lengthy confession and penance and preparation. Um, and the precious blood, forget about it. The last thing they need is, you know, Zlog the barbarian coming in here and spilling the wine somewhere. Um, so, okay, this is all background stuff. We, we, we've covered that. And now we're going to turn to the communion service there in the prayer book. Um, particularly, just go right, you can go right to the um, prayer of consecration, which is page, I should know this, um, page 80. Okay. So, this, just like baptism and confirmation, matrimony, holy orders, you want to know the Anglican teaching on the Eucharist, you have to look at the communion service, the rite. The articles can be very helpful. The catechism can be very helpful. Um, but really, the, the meat of it the, the, is in the rite, the word that we actually say, because the law of prayer is the law of belief. Um, and even this long, very long prayer of consecration that we have really can't capture the mystery of the Eucharist, how this um, bread and wine is transformed by the power of Christ uh, into his sacramental body and blood and what that, what that does to us. But there's often, um, I, I say all that because there's often uh, criticisms that, well, the Anglican church and the Anglican tradition is all over the map doctrinally with different things, you know, and that is only the case when they abandon the Book of Common Prayer. In just about every case, every case I can think of in history, um, when, say, people have come along and said, well, we don't believe in baptismal regeneration. That, I, I don't agree with that. So I'm going to just take that part out of the prayer book. Or we're going to write our own prayer book changes the words. And then they so-called themselves Anglicans. Now, it's plain to see what's wrong with that. That's like saying, well, I'm a Roman Catholic, but I don't think that the Pope is infallible. I just just don't, don't like that. I, I disagree with that. Well, you, you're free to think whatever you want about the Pope and the infallibility of the Pope, but you really shouldn't call yourself a Roman Catholic if you do not believe in that particular doctrine. So, you know, you might have Anglicans that say, well, I just believe that the Eucharist is a memorial. It's the bread and wine does not become the body and blood of Christ. Does that really agree with what we see in the Book of Common Prayer? It doesn't. And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at now. So I hope that makes sense. Like you, you basically you have to just rip out pages of, of the prayer book to, um, you know, support heterodox doctrine and teaching. That, so I will say I am looking forward to you showing us where that, where that is. Mm -hmm. As you, yeah, so sure you, sure you hit me over the head with that. Yes, absolutely. So well, it's all over the place. So. Um, Okay, so we start off with, now this, this prayer, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, this um, prayer of consecration that we read there on page 80 and 81 is, the, is the, what is closest to Archbishop Cranmer's original prayer book of 1549. All glory be to thee, almighty God, our heavenly Father, for that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. Why he died on the cross? Not because he had nothing better to do for our redemption, to save us. Who made there 
by his one oblation of himself once offered. Oblation means offer, an offering. So this is a, a direct dig against the contemporary at the time. Roman Catholic belief that then you had to offer other sacrifices of masses to atone for other sins that the cross did not atone for. He died once uh, on the cross. He offered one, one oblation of himself once offered. He offered himself a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. So again, that, re that emphasizes that this is a one-time deal. He is not being re-sacrificed every time the Mass is being celebrated. He's not being re-immolated. And did institute, and in his holy gospel, command us to continue a perpetual memory of that, his precious death and sacrifice, until his coming again. So that's referencing, of course, the Last Supper, where Jesus institutes this holy sacrament um, in memory of what he is about to do there on the cross. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. You see these little italicized letters there. Uh, those are called manual acts. Uh, you do them with your hands. Um, we, we generally follow those. Um, for in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Um, so those are the, the words of institution. They come straight from scripture. Um, you'll, in church, you'll see us, at least here at St. Albans and most of our APA parishes, you'll see us genuflecting and elevating the host and you'll hear bells ringing and incense will be going. None of that is in, in the prayer book. That's all just devotional things that are added to the service. You could leave all of that out. You could leave all of that out and still have a 100% valid Catholic Eucharist. In fact, I'm told that years ago, back in the 60s, at the Virginia Theological Seminary, in their old chapel, they would actually celebrate the Eucharist at the north end of the altar. So basically, instead of standing, uh, you know, with facing the altar with your back to the people or in a modern setting, facing the people with the altar between you. They're actually over here on the side, kind of like this. And uh, the guy that went to Virginia Seminary, he was a priest, an Episcopal priest who became one of the original priests in, in the ACC church I was in at the time, said the, the clergy would, would um, follow these manual acts in here to the letter um, he would take the cup into his hands and then put it down and then just start reading and then take the bread. <laughs> so what we do is very elaborate compared, compared to all of that. But it's, just, it's all just devotion. It's a tradition, which is why we do it. It does affirm our belief in the real presence, I will say. You know, when we elevate the host and we make the sign of the cross and it's traditional to say when the host is elevated, you whisper to yourself, my Lord and my God, you say the words of St. Thomas um, and make the sign, the sign of the cross. So it reaffirms those beliefs um, in the real presence of Christ. Okay, continuing. Okay, we come to the next section of the prayer of consecration. The oblation, it says off to the side, and we'll get to that. This is also called an anamnesis. Where, and I'll explain that in just a second. Let me read. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we thy humble servants do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, 
his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. The anamnesis is the part of the prayer that says, okay, Jesus tells us to do this. So look, Jesus, we did it. D did you get that? Wherefore, according to the institution, we celebrate and make here before thee. So we're saying, okay, we're being obedient to our Lord in doing what he said to do. Now, oblation, <laughs> again, that means offering. Where, where does that come from? With these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee. That is the oblation. In fact, in certain um, editions of the Scottish prayer book, uh, which ours is based on, um, those words were written in all capital letters to emphasize the fact that we have taken, according to our Lord's command, bread and wine, and in the, through the ministry of the sacramental ministerial priesthood, the Lord has transformed them into his body and blood. This is my body. This is my blood. We are now offering that to God the Father. We are offering the body and blood of Christ to God the Father in union, as we'll see at the end, in union with our Lord Jesus Christ. And therein is the sacrifice, the sacrifice of the service. So we talk about the sacrifice of the Mass. The Eucharist is a sacrifice, the holy sacrifice. This is it. He is not being, Christ is not being re-sacrificed, only we are sacramentally participating in his one oblation of himself once offered. Uh, in heaven, what is our Lord doing for us? He is, has, is in what's called the heavenly session. He is interceding for us at the throne of God. In the book of Revelation, he is described as a lamb as, as it had been slain. So you can imagine our Lord Jesus in heaven showing the wounds on his hands the wound on his side in his glorified resurrection body saying, look, Father, I have paid for the sins of the world. I have atoned for the sins of the whole world and you can show mercy, you can give peace. And we then are participating in that through the offering of the bread and the wine. It's quite, quite profound. Um, because otherwise, what is our worship about? Oh, I'm going to go to church and sing my heart out to, to worship and offer my praise to Jesus. You know, uh, and, and then we're like, holy, holy, holy Lord. I mean, if that's your worship, you are in big trouble because it's not good. I'm going to give to God a big check. Oh, this is going to be a hundred dollar check this week. The Bible says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. What does he need your hundred dollars for? So the point is, we say we go to church to worship God. How? How do we worship God? What can we possibly offer to God? What can we, oh, I'm giving him myself, my soul. Your soul is rotten. And so is mine. So, this is, this is how we worship God, the body and blood of Christ. We plead nothing before God except our Lord Jesus crucified for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. He worships God the Father and we, as part of him, worship the Father through him and in him. And then what we offer to God, our mediocre singing, our gifts, that wonderful that wonderful $10,000 check you're going to give to the building fund of St. Albans um, is rendered acceptable because it's offered uh, to, in and through our Lord Jesus Christ and his one oblation of himself once offered. Send in the check. Send in the check. <laughs> I'm a silly guy. You guys know that. Um, all right, let's continue. So next we have the invocation. Um, 
that's where we, we would call this also in the theological tradition, the epiclesis, this calling down of the Holy Spirit. Now, before I read this, um, I will say that in the Eucharistic prayers, the ordering is sometimes changed around. So in some traditions, the epiclesis or the invocation will be at the beginning of the service or the beginning of the canon of the Mass. Other traditions, it's in the middle, like ours. Other traditions don't have an epiclesis. There is no epiclesis in the Roman Gregorian canon. There's no epiclesis historically in the, um, in the Western Rite. So what, what Cranmer here was doing by including this uh, is actually shows an Eastern Christian influence, which we see in various parts of, of the prayer book. Um, okay, so let's read it. Page 81. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness, vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit, these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. Now, the original wording of that uh, in the first prayer book of Cranmer and in the Scottish prayer book, whence our tradition comes, that's a whole other topic, um, actually says that it may become the body and blood of Christ. So it was, um, it, it got a little watered down here. Um, that was due to the influence of Bishop William White, the first bishop of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and that's a whole nother, a whole nother story. But nonetheless, here we call, ask God to bless and sanctify these gifts and creatures of bread and wine that we receiving them uh, maybe partakers of his most blessed body and blood. Now my predecessor of blessed memory, Father Unterberger. There he is. He used to say, he maintained that the canon that I'm reading, the prayer of consecration, canon of the mass, whatever you want to call it, was fundamentally Eastern in design because it is an Eastern tradition that what, affects the change in the elements of bread and wine is the epiclesis, calling the Holy Ghost down upon the elements. It is the Western tradition that says it's the words of institution that affect the change, which is why the bells ring at that time. So now I'm going to go into why Father Unterberger, he passed away a few years ago, um, why, why he said that. Um, and you can read a lot about that. Dom Gregory Dix has a very good section on the, the development of that idea of when does the change happen in his uh, magnum opus, The Shape of the Liturgy. It's quite interesting. And that, that whole discussion probably started around the, the 400s, I want to say, in the church. People just kind of began to wonder, hmm, when does the bread become the body of of Christ. When does the wine become the blood of Christ? I think it's here. Oh, I think it's got to be, got to be here. Anyway, Father Unterberger maintained that, um, that, uh, and I, if you have any thoughts on this, let me know that this is a fundamentally Eastern prayer because after the invocation here that we just read, the Epiclesis, it only refers to the body and blood of Christ. Before this, it will say bread and wine, which is a kind of an interesting, uh, I don't know where he got that from, um, but kind of an interesting thing to consider. Now, Bishop Chad Jones, our diocesan bishop and dear friend and once rector of this parish, has somewhere on his blog, which people don't really read a lot of blogs anymore, but he had a really good one and it's still out there called Phil Orthodox. Um, he had a fantastic article basically agreeing with Dom Gregory Dix 
who the Anglican monastic who wrote the shape of the liturgy, one of the most important liturgical scholars in the 20th century, saying that you can't look for the change to occur in this moment or this word or here. It's, it's the whole Eucharistic prayer. It's the whole Eucharistic prayer that, that makes bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ, which makes perfect sense because in the ancient church, they did not have Eucharistic prayers written down like we have them today. The guy went up there and just kind of, you know, ad-libbed it, you know. So, anywho, let's uh, continue. <coughs> Last part of the prayer. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. So we're clearly in the celebration of this sacrament, um, asking God to grant us the forgiveness of sins through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so that when we receive the body and blood of Christ, our sins are forgiven, our souls are cleansed. You know, of course, we have confessed our sins right before this, before this um and then we come to this wonderful part this is one of my favorite parts and here we offer and present unto thee o lord ourselves our souls and bodies to be a reasonable holy and living sacrifice unto thee that comes from romans i believe it's chapter eight where saint paul says i beseech you therefore brethren that you make yourselves a a living sacrifice to god um humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, benediction means blessing, and made one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him. That makes perfect sense from just a you know, biological perspective because you, you are eating the bread, the body of Christ, you're drinking his blood. And when you eat what you, you are, what you eat, according to the great um, Orthodox liturgical scholar, Alexander Schmemann, um, or as one of my seminary friends used to call him, Schmemann. So you are what you eat. So we eat the body and blood of Christ and we become one uh, with him. He dwells in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy, so our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice. Yet we beseech thee to accept this, our bounden duty and service. Like, we, you, we're we doing this because you said to do this, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses. And this overlooked, but so important, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, all of this is offered, our, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, ourselves, our souls and bodies, the bread and wine, which ostensibly represents the labor of our hands, um, is offered in union and through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. <coughs> um, and then we see italicized, amen. Now, pet peeve of Father Gordon, amen is what the congregation says. So I'm praying the prayer on behalf of the congregation, and you say amen if you agree with it. So it's a very, and for you clergy out there, it's a very bad habit to get into to say amen yourself, because Amen is the response. If you start saying amen, they're never going to say it. That was the case here at St. Albans for a few years until finally we, we got it, we got it right. And actually, um, Mr. Mr. Glock helped with that a lot. So, anywho. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now let's go to the next page, 82. We have the prayer of humble access otherwise sometimes called the humble crumble because at this time you often you know break the host into smaller pieces 
or you're kneeling down and kind of crumbling down your body. Um, this uh, is the original place of this prayer in the English prayer book uh, of 1662. Um, and actually going back to 1552, um, it was put at the beginning of the canon of the mass as, as sort of a pre prelude to the, to the consecration. But this is the original place. Um, the priest is supposed to say this. We have a tradition here where the congregation says it together. Um, I don't know. The prayer book says that just the priest is supposed to say it. I, this, we say it here together because that's how I found it when I got here. And I'm not going to change around things too much. Um, but it says, we do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table. But thou art the same Lord, and th those are biblical references. You know, even the dogs eat the, the crumbs that fall from their master's table. We just heard that uh, the other day. But thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Um, and then let's just, I'll skip that through the rubrics here because uh, I want to wrap this up pretty shortly. We have the words of administration. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for thee, and be thankful. Those are the words that are said when you make your communion, when the priest offers you the bread wine, the body and blood of Christ. Note it says, it does not say the bread that we think reminds us of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Or the wine that is not his actual blood, but just reminds us of it. They're, the priest is giving you, the host, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can't get much clearer than that, folks. It is the body and blood of Christ. Now, the Anglican Church does not define the mode of Christ's presence. This is the, the problem with transubstantiation. We are one with the Orthodox tradition in that. It, it's a mystery. It, it becomes the body and blood of Christ, um, but we don't define the mode of Christ's presence. Yes? Well, no, it's, it's a subtle point, I guess. If, if you make it that argument, you're not disputing with the Catholic Church that bread and wine becomes the body and the blood. You're only quibbling about how it happens. Right, exactly. You know, through this, this you know, that it doesn't happen through transubstantiation. Correct, exactly. How it happens, correct, exactly. Yeah, we have no problem with the... No, it's, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, now, I had a, I, I met a guy at a clergy conference once. Um, he was trying to come into our diocese. Maybe he was looking after one of our churches, and then he, he didn't fit in. He ended up going to another church, another jurisdiction. But he was railing against the doctrine of transubstantiation. You know, okay, great. Good, good Anglican. But then he goes, this is how the change takes place. And he went on to flawlessly explain the theology of John Calvin. Eh, wrong. The number one thing is we don't explain it. We can't. We can't explain this, this mystery. It's like trying to explain the mystery of the Holy Trinity. You know, you, you can't. It's, I mean, you can sort of get your hands around part of it and get aspects of it. And, 
um, but we, we can do that. But yeah, we don't have any problem with, um, it's, I'd say really kind of an academic point with, uh, is our difference with the, the Roman church. Uh, unfortunately, what they did with their doctrine of transubstantiation um, is they raised it to the level of a dogma, uh, which was one of the contributing factors to the East-West split of the church. So they, they really angered uh, their Eastern Christian brethren by taking this, this doctrine that was uh, being discussed in the universities and elevating it to this level of dogma. And they've done that a lot. I don't want to beat on the Roman Catholic Church. It's not my intention. I went to a Roman Catholic seminary. Okay, I took the test. I passed it. I could be a Roman Catholic priest today. But they've done this a lot over the years. Papal infallibility is another example, you know. And they, they, they'll complain left and right about, well, that, what, look what the Anglicans did to mess up ecumenical relations. Look what the, look what this group did to mess up ecumenical relations. Well, as the old preacher said once, brother, you've got one finger pointing out there and you've got three fingers pointing back at yourself. So the Roman Catholic Church, God love them. They've got enough of their problem, their problems on their own. They've also done some things that have hurt our ecumenical relations and split the church. And one of them is the doctrine of transubstantiation. We're making it a dogma. You have to believe this like you believe the Holy Trinity. It's much easier to be Anglican or, dare I say, Orthodox, the mystery. Jesus says, it's my body, it's my blood, and that's what it is. Um, so uh, I want to just look at one... Thing here. Okay, if you go to page 84, so after the communion, now I just criticized the Roman Catholic Church, which I love, but we, we do a lot of Roman Catholic practices. <laughs> so they got a whole lot of stuff right. One of them is um, they, they, after the Holy Communion, we clean up the altar. It's called the ablutions. We consume the rest of the elements wash the vessels. That is not in the prayer book. Uh, in the, if you're going strictly by what's in the prayer book, you do that at the, after the service is over. You see the rubric there says, when all have communicated, the priest shall return to the Lord's table and reverently place upon it what remaineth of the consecrated elements, covering the same with a fair cloth. So uh, we, we could certainly do it that way if we wanted to, but then I'd be late for coffee hour. And someone else would get all that other good food. <laughs> so, no, but this is what, with that in mind, I wanted us to look at page 84, the third uh, one to the fourth rubric. If any of the consecrated bread and wine remain after the communion, it shall not be carried out of the church, but the minister and other communicants shall immediately after the blessing reverently eat and drink the same. Why? Because it is the body and blood of Christ. We don't just throw it out. We don't. Um, leave it, you know, to take home and eat as a snack later. Um, it is to be consumed or, in some cases, reserved to be taken for the sick. Uh, so that, again, refer, affirms our belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, that the bread and wine, through the power of Christ, by way of the ministerial priesthood, becomes his body and blood for the strengthening of our, of our souls for this journey uh, that we have. We didn't touch too much on sacrifice. We'll, we might get back into that when we talk about the doctrine of holy orders, um, the doctrine of Eucharistic sacrifice. We touched on it very briefly. Um, we touched on the, the mode of Christ's presence very briefly. Um, but that, I think, is uh, probably a good, good place to stop for now. Okay, we're running about 8.25. Are there any questions or final comments or thoughts from my live studio audience? Maybe from the clergy behind me. Okay. Hearing none, we will close with prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in thy mercy, grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. Amen. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. You take care.